So we are in week five of our You Asked For It series, and if this is your first time with us or first time online, we love you guys, by the way. Um, If it's your first time with us, we asked all of you to let us know what your questions are, and we're preaching in response to those questions. And so we didn't get to all of them, but we got to all the ones that were asked the most, and you're really going to see that today in today's message. So I'm going to roll us right into these questions, and they're doozies, folks. Let's go. What is righteousness? And what does it look like? Second one, why do we pray for forgiveness for our sins if our sins from the past, present, and future were forgiven a long time ago? That's a head scratcher. Third one, we've been taught to ask for forgiveness. This is a long one, right? Are you stressed already? (laughs) We've been taught to ask for forgiveness and that we'll be forgiven and our sins forgotten by God. However, we've also been taught that we'll face judgment at the end for all we've done. So are my sins forgiven and forgotten, or do they linger until Judgment Day? Could you elaborate, Pastor? And by the way, back it up with Scripture. (laughs) Do you love the boldness of that person? They actually wrote it. I did not change those words. About three different people wrote a variation on that question, but I put that whole back it up with uh, Scripture thing at the end because one of them asked it that way, and I just love, love, love that. I love someone who maybe has heard a thing in church and they're like, but I don't feel like I've heard enough Bible to back that truth up. Help me understand it better. And by the way, that's the way you're supposed to operate as Christians. Amen? It's the way that we're supposed to operate as Christians. So as you can see from those three questions, um, I just read them to you now. We're going to get back to them at the very end, but I've got to teach some foundational stuff in the middle so that you understand the answers to those questions. But as you can see, they are all about sin and salvation. They are big, big topics. And some of you are like, well, I learned all I need to know in Sunday school. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. There's there's some really big stuff here that we think we know, but we don't know. We think we understand, but we don't understand. And, and, And Pastor Ricky and I, across the last year, we've talked about the fact that God has forgiven our past, present, and future sins. And that's messed with some of you because some of you have come from a church tradition where your future sins were a real issue. And every time you sinned again, even after you were saved and you became one with Jesus Christ, Every time you sin from that point forward, it was as if you yo-yoed away from God and now you're in darkness again and your relationship with God is all broken again and you should feel guilty and bad again and you should be afraid about whether or not you're really going to be saved again. And then you try to get in his good graces again and you yo-yo back. So this is the anti-yo-yo sermon. Amen? We're going to try and deal with this. And I love, again, that you said, show us Bible so we can really believe this. Praise God, because it's not my words that matter. They are his words that matter. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that for many of us, God, you would just wake us up right now, because we ate turkey, God. We ate turkey, and we're tired. But Jesus, I pray for spiritually, mentally speaking, a splash of ice cold water on our brains right now, that we would wake up and be alert and be sharp so that we can understand these things. And God, I pray for the old Christians in the room. I pray for the old Christians that feel like they've heard all this before. I pray that you would tenderize our hearts right now. I pray that you would open us up to maybe hear some things we haven't heard before, learn some things we haven't learned before. And God, just just to be open to what the Holy Spirit might do afresh in me today. In Christ's name, amen. 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 I'll also let you know this before we get into the first scripture, that at the end of today's service, I am going to give you an opportunity to reach out to Jesus Christ as your Savior for the very first time. It's been a little while since we've offered that, but we are going to do a salvation prayer at the very end. So if you've never done that before, you're going to have an opportunity to walk in that prayer with us. So first scripture, Matthew 18. 
This is a parable. Some of you guys have heard this before. Um, Powerful, powerful parable from Jesus. Um, It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Now, Peter came and asked, should it be seven times? The, The rabbis of that day had suggested to people that it's probably good to forgive someone for the same exact sin about three times. That's a good upper limit before you find stick it to him. So Peter is coming to Jesus and saying, how about seven? Peter thinks he's being generous. Jesus is like, nope, 70 times seven. And he doesn't for you math people mean 490. Amen. He's trying to give us a number that points to infinity. Never, ever stop forgiving people. And then Jesus is going to go and illustrate this. Therefore, verse 23, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. So he's, he's, he's cashing it all in, right? Making everybody pay their debts. And in the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. Now, um, a modern translation might say millions of dollars. Some of your versions might say 10,000 talents. The Greek there is myriad a myriad, which means 10,000 talents. We're going to get into that in just a second. Millions of dollars he couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything that he owned to pay the debt because slavery was not based on your race in those days. It was based on you paying back a debt, at least usually. Now let's talk about what he owed. 10,000 talents. A myriad. One talent was the average annual salary for a worker, just to put it in context. So 10,000 of those, he's coming and he's saying, I owe 10,000. How are you going to pay 10,000 unless you're going to live for 10,000 years? The answer is you're not. Myriad also is the highest um, simple descriptor of a number in the Greek language. If you want to go beyond, you've got to use extra words in order to describe that new number. So a myriad was often used as something to mean an infinitely high number. 10,000 talents. Just to put this in context, I did the math on this. If you make $40,000 a year currently, that would mean your debt was $400 million. If you make $60,000 a year as a family, that means your debt would have been $600 million. If you make $100,000 per year as a family on your tax form, that means your debt would have been a billion dollars in Jesus' parable. What's his point? You can't pay it. No matter what. You are hopeless in this situation. Verse 26, but the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me. I will pay it all. How are you going to do that, fella? You can't. And please be patient with me. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him, and he forgave his debt. What do you mean you'll pay it back? Just give me a little bit more time. It's laughable, is it not? It's supposed to be. This is Jesus' point. You're in such a spot with God. You cannot pay it back. And how many of us come to God and say, just give me a little bit more time. I will balance out the scales of justice myself for all the bad things that I've done. I, just trust me, God. I will do enough to clean my life up. And Jesus says, it's impossible. Now, what's this guy doing when he says, just give me a little bit more time? Sometimes you, you might be tempted to read this parable and think that this guy is coming and he's actually taking ownership for his life. And that would be good, right? Like we teach our kids to take ownership for what they've done and clean up their own messes. This is good basic morality. But I don't think that's what this guy is doing. And, and, and I think you're going to see it in his motives at the very end of the story. I think this is what he's doing, three things. Number one, I think he's minimizing the problem. What I've done isn't that bad. My debt isn't that big. Oh, yes, it is. The next thing I think he's doing is I think he thinks this little act of repentance is what the king wants from him. And it's not what the king wants. The king doesn't want him to stand there and say, I'm going to try and pay this back myself. The king is loving and the king understands the truth of the situation. The king wants to forgive him. 
Number three, I think the man is trying to keep a little bit of his own dignity. Can you relate to that? Because if I clean up my own mess, I get to stand back at the very end of the whole thing and say, I pulled myself up from my own bootstraps. And that feels good to us. So next verse. But when the man left the king, after he'd been forgiven for the 10,000 talents, $1 billion, when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. And he grabbed him by the throat and he demanded instant payment. Notice the condition of the man's heart because that's really the point. Not so much the action of the man, but the action of the man reflects the condition of the man's heart. Here's the question. Has the man's heart changed? No. No. And that's the point. The point is, he said some religious words to God. He tried to do some religious things, but no heart change happened. Ever been there? Ever been there? Ever, ever looked back at part of your life and said, I was walking through some religious motions. I was kind of trying, but the heart change didn't happen for me. For some reason, it didn't take. Jesus is giving us a really clear parable of a guy who it, it just didn't take. And we're going to try to explore why didn't it take. And we're going to hopefully have some good guesses. But he's trying to earn his way. That's the first thing. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 says it like this. And you who were dead in your trespasses, that's your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses or sins by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now, this is yet another spot in the New Testament where the Bible comes and takes your sins and your guilt and calls them debts. And for some of us, that kind of messes with us a little bit. But that's what Jesus did in that parable, right? Peter's talking to him about forgiving people, and Jesus converts it into a financial debt story. But that's one of the clearest illustrations that's all throughout Scripture. Why? Because it makes sense to us. We get credit card bills. Anybody get a credit card bill? Anybody's credit card bill going to be worse in January than it is right now? Let's hope not, right? Let's say I borrow your car, and I drive recklessly, and I wreck your car. I total your car. If that happens, do you forgive me? Maybe. <laughs> But what does forgiveness actually look like in that situation? It's a new car. And so what can you do? You could sue me for the cost of the car that I just wrecked for you. That would not be forgiveness, amen? That would be me paying the debt for what I just took away from you. Or you could buy a new car yourself and leave me out of it and say, I forgive you. But in that case, you're paying the debt. Yes? Either way, a debt got paid. Or there's the third option, you just never drive again. <laughs> and you go without a car. But if you go without a car, you're still paying a debt, aren't you? Right? You're still going without. So in all three possible scenarios, there's still a debt in place. And isn't that the way the world works? In everything. Right? Like, if I offend you, I hurt your feelings, I betray you, you will never forget it for the rest of your life. You just won't. It's going to stick. And don't our offenses against each other stick? And don't we want them to stick in the universe? We do. Right? We want justice. We want justice. It's inside of us. And that desire for justice is not wrong. It's why we have courts, amen? It's why we have cancel culture. It is. And it's real. And some of us like to bad talk cancel culture. Can I just say this? Cancel culture is not new. We've got better phrases and names for it right now. But cancel culture has been around a long, long time. Especially in the church. We're pros at canceling people who cross certain lines. Oh, everything just got quiet. Aren't we, though? I'm not going to go into that too much. I'll just say this. Every generation that comes up in their late teens and early 20s, 
They're all about justice. They're all about let's raise a standard against what's gone wrong in this society. And they're ready to cancel people and bring justice against the wrongdoers because they're frustrated with the overpatience of the generations that went before them. And they feel strong that way. We should not be surprised that they feel that way. You used to feel that way until you hit your 30s. You know why it changed? Because you sinned a whole lot more by the time you got to your 30s. All those standards that were so important to you, what you found out by your 30s and 40s is that you had broken most of your own standards. You couldn't live up to them anymore. And what you think was you softening and becoming a kinder person was just you becoming a more realistic person about yourself. Oh, I've said too much. Cancel culture isn't new. There's something deep inside of us that's justice. And we get it. And we want justice. And we want a God who wants justice. We want a loving God, but we also want a just God. And Yahweh from the beginning has always been the perfect holy combination of love and justice together. And what you're going to see in salvation today, what you're going to see when it comes to your sin and forgiveness, is that his love and his, his justice come together in a way that maybe you've never understood before. Okay, so imagine that you're a murderer, and you're on death row, and we've already assigned your date of execution. That's a lovely thought, isn't it? Happy holidays. Um, so you're on death row, and you look down the cell block, and you see all the other prisoners who are also sentenced to die for the crimes that they've done. And you call up the warden one day, and you say, hey, warden, how about this? I would like to die for everybody else on the cell block. I got this great idea. I'll go to the execution chair, and when I die, you'll count that as payment for all the things that everybody else in the cell block has done. How about that? Does anyone see the logic problem here? The warden would laugh at you. Why? Because you have no, no moral standing by which to give this gift. You're a murderer already. You're guilty already. You owe the debt already. From a moral justice perspective, you have nothing to give anybody else. Sacrifice. What sacrifice? You're going to be killed for what you did. Do you see it? So who then, it's about qualification, who is qualified to die for mankind? Nobody in this room. I mean, no offense, but you've done your own stuff. The, the only person who could die on a cross for humanity was God. And there's, there's a whole list of reasons for that. But the main reason for it is he's the only one who could pull it off. But he came to this world and he lived a sinless life and he was tempted in every single way that we we're tempted. And not only did he get through the whole thing to 30 years old, never having sinned once, but he also achieved all the righteous deeds that God called him to achieve. He did it perfectly. So when he stood up and said, I'll die on the cross with my innocence for humanity, he actually had something to give. Do you see why Jesus, our perfect Jesus, was the only one who could ever die on a cross for us? Because he had something to give, and he paid our debt for us, is what the Bible says. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift. That means free, by the way. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. No way. So none of us can boast about it. Salvation is a free, free gift. And that self-reliance part of us that wants to pull ourselves up for our, from our own bootstraps, like it, that messes with us. Free gift, free grace messes with our self-reliance. Can we admit that? It makes several of us in the church very, very uncomfortable. But this is the terms of the arrangement that God has put out there. This is the way that it's done. Here's another important point. It's free to you. Free to you in the sense that you never have to do anything morally to counterbalance the justice scales against you. But it was not free to God. It cost him everything. 
It costs Jesus everything. We're going into Christmas time, amen? amen. And we're going to celebrate a baby who was born. Why are we celebrating a baby who was born? Because he came to do this. He came to die for us. He came to pay. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a German pastor, was a German pastor at the time of the Nazis. And as he, his part of his story, it's a fascinating story, you should read about him. Bonhoeffer um, was this German pastor, and as the Nazis started to grow in power and started to oppress the Jewish people in Germany, of course, he became deeply offended, deeply worried about all of that. There's a, there's a little season where he like actually left to America to escape it, and then when he was in this American church, he became convicted that he had abandoned his people and his role, and he went back to Germany in the thick of it, and he joined a plot to kill Hitler and that really messes with some of us pacifists in the room. And I'm not going to comment on that, but he was actually captured, sent to a concentration camp, and he died there. That's the backstory of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. One of the things he said in, in one of his books, The Cost of Discipleship, is this. He said, grace is costly because it costs a man his life. It is grace because it gives a man the only true life is costly because it condemns our sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it's costly because it costs God. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. We want grace to be cheap. And it wasn't. Free to us does not mean cheap. So we're going to explore that. We want cheap grace. Remember the guy at the very beginning of the parable? who's like, ah, just give me a little time. I can pay this back. We want it to be small, do we not? And we want that for ourselves. I'm getting into the real stuff right now. This is what cheap grace looks like. And we want cheap grace. We want to be, number one, we want to be excused. Excused. We want God to come along in this kindly grandfatherly voice and be like, ah, I understand what you did. And it wasn't that bad. Like that's what we want to be. We want grace. We want forgiveness that excuses our bad behavior. That is not what biblical grace looks like. Secondly, we want grace, cheap grace, that's an easy pardon. <clears throat> you know when presidents pardon people? People have mixed feelings about that. You ever have mixed feelings about a presidential pardon? Come on. Sometimes it's very appropriate. Sometimes maybe you'd look back at it and you'd say, you know what, this person's already paid their, their debt to society or maybe they're wrongly convicted or, or there's all kinds of reasons that you might think it was good. But for somebody who is truly guilty and the list of victims goes on and on, there's often a call with a pardon like that that says, wait a second, justice here was not done. And people get frustrated about it. And here's the thing, what does it cost a president to pardon someone? The answer is nothing. In our society, nothing. God did not easy pardon you at the cross. He did not ignore justice at the cross. God himself paid your debt at the cross. That's the difference. If presidents had to pay the debt of the people they pardoned, how many pardons would we see? Some of you are awake. Okay, next. <laughs> Cheap grace. Grace. An act of leniency. We don't want leniency. Leniency is awful. Leniency is, is a version of mercy that just comes along and says, I'm just going to no notch down your punishment just a bit because I'm in a good mood today. That's not real forgiveness and it's not real grace. Cheap grace lets us downplay our guilt. Cheap grace lets us keep some of our dignity, our false, false dignity. And cheap grace isn't bloody. Cheap grace isn't bloody. Real grace is bloody. Real grace cost our Savior something. So here's the responses. <sighs> to be excused. He's not excusing, he's paying. It's an easy pardon. Nope, easy pardons aren't justice. 
It's an act of leniency. The cost was not lowered for you. It was paid in full by Jesus. We, we, when we look at our own pile of sin for the, our own things that we have done, we like to look at it and say, I could take leniency. I could take a pardon. I could take excuses. I, like, I could do all of this, right? But when we think about child abusers, when we think about serial killers, when we think about racists, when we think about Hitler, you don't want cheap grace for them. You want every single cent paid for them. It's just the way that we all of a sudden, our justice jumps up and we're like, I don't want a God who winks at sin. I don't want a God who ignores victims. We should not want cheap grace. We should be disgusted, actually, by cheap grace. Um, so there's this old story it's not actually old. I said that first service too. I got it wrong. You know, sometimes when you preach three services, you get it wrong every single service. <laughs> Just fall into patterns. It's weird. Um, <clears throat> so I think this book is like 20 years old, so not very old at all. And it's actually not even a very good book, so I'm not recommending it to you today. Um, it's this book called Aragon, and it's about dragons and all this kind of stuff. And there's three books, three really long books, over long books, by the way, of C-plus material is what I'm just going to say. <laughs> So I don't recommend it. But anyway, I somehow survived through three long books of C plus material. And because I like, you know, fantasy stuff. And so I got to the end of it. And the whole thing has been about this war between this guy, Aragon, who is, you know, he's kind of a sorcerer kind of a guy. And this other guy named Galvatorix, who's a like big emperor guy. And he's in charge of everything. He's like a dictator. And he's been in charge of this whole country, this whole area for a hundred years super long lifespan, and he's done terrible things. Like all these people have been murdered and killed and, and, and all, these, you know, all these marriages blown apart and, 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 and he's caused his armies to do all these terrible things. And anyway, it's just gone on and on and on. So at, finally, they're at the end of three overlong books and they're having their battle. And you're like, how is this gonna conclude? At least the ending ought to be good, Amen. And Aragon proclaims a curse over the bad guy. And here's the curse he uses. He says, I want you right now to feel the emotional devastation for every single thing you've ever done to another person, and you're going to feel it all at once. So just process this for a second, because this is going to help us. Every single murder... Every single widow who goes a life without their spouse. Every single widower who goes through life without that partner. Every single um, orphaned child. Every single person thrust into poverty and, and the impact of that. And the hunger and the fear about my next meal tomorrow. And all of that. And, and every single thing that he had commanded all of his armies to do. All the atrocities that they had done as well. If you could take all the emotional pain caused by just that one individual over a hundred years. And you pile it right back on him and make him feel it all at once. What would that do to you? And the book describes it well and says it just absolutely ended the man right there. He couldn't handle it. You couldn't handle it. And again, we spend so much of our time trying not to think about what it is that we have done. And we have these Sunday school conversations and we talk about little white lies. But let's be real. What about our cruelty for real? What about our selfish acts every single day in our families where we put our needs above everybody else? Come on. What about the addictions that we give into and we bring darkness into the ongoing generations of our family instead of breaking the curse? What about all of it? All of it in your past, all of it in your future. What about all of it that you've actually done? Can God see it all in a big pile? And what if the big pile was put on you? Terrible day. And the scripture says that the entire pile and all of it was put on Jesus. All of it was put on Jesus. You think about the cross, okay? Sometimes, again, we, we kind of start out and we think, well, the cross is all about the pain that Jesus suffered, the physical pain, the fact that he was killed, the fact that he was tortured, and all that's true. 
And he suffered all of that for us. But when Jesus stood in the garden of Gethsemane and said, Father, let this cup pass from me. I'm not sure I want to drink the cup of your wrath that's against all of mankind for everything that everybody ever did. He's talking about something else there. He's talking about taking on the the spiritual and the emotional actual consequence of every single dark act we've ever done. You can't fathom that. But here's where it hits home for me. My choices added to it. My choices added to it. And when it comes to my choices, when it comes to my guilt, when it comes to my debt, he actually paid it in full. And that actually means something. He didn't wave a magic wand. He paid it. And you're like, are you trying to say Jesus felt? I, I don't know what he felt. I don't know how it worked, right? Like we're not told it's a spiritual mystery in the scripture. We're just told he paid the debt. Let your brain go there for just a minute. Because I think the costly grace of Jesus Christ demands respect. I think the costly grace of Jesus Christ demands a gratitude from us that a lot of us aren't giving God. A life of gratitude. Not only did it cost him, not only was grace costly to him, but grace is costly to us. You're like, well, you said, I thought just a minute ago we said it was free. It is free. It is free from the sense that you don't have to pay back the moral debt that you owe for all the moral things that you've done wrong, and you never have to. But you do have to surrender your life to God. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus was was risen from the dead, if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, then you will be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10 Those are the two steps that you have to take. When you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, do you know what you're saying? You're saying, God, you're my master. God, you're in charge, and I'm not in charge anymore. And that's surrender. And that kind of surrender, that messes with us. And it's a high cost for many of us. Have you surrendered your life to God actually? Because for many of us that have just walked out some religious steps and the change never took, I would say for many of us, it's because we never surrendered. Uh, Martin Luther, the old theologian, called it the, the great exchange. He said, Jesus gave his entire life for you, and you give your entire life back to him. Does that mean that I, I've got to live it perfect, and I've got to like become a nun or a priest now? No, that's not what it's talking about. But it is saying that you put all of your life in his hands. Sometimes people ask me as a pastor, they'll say, God, or they'll say, Josh, why... Why doesn't God allow everybody into heaven? If heaven's so great, why doesn't God just open up the gates super wide and let everybody in? And my answer to that would be that that's the wrong question. The question is, should God force everybody into heaven, whether or not they want to go? That's the real question, because that's what God won't do. Because If you were just taught that heaven is just about streets of gold and everything's great and you eat all the food that you want at the buffet and you don't gain any weight, that's not the way that the Bible describes heaven. Heaven is where we will worship and serve Jesus Christ for the rest of eternity because we love him. And it'll flow out of us in a spirit of changed heart and gratitude as the people of God. The sons and daughters of God will be the sons and daughters of God for all eternity. And we will love every single minute of it. But what if you don't like God? Will he force you into that? No. You're like, well, everybody ought to like God. Here's why they don't. Here's why people don't want God. I've analyzed this. As always, here we go. Number one, we demand self-reliance. We do want to pull ourselves up from our own bootstraps. And the idea that free grace is free grace and that we are only indebted to God with gratitude for the rest of eternity, many of us do not like that. We'd rather achieve. We'd rather feel the self-confidence from our achievement if we're real. Number two, I demand to be my own master. It's my career. It is my money. It is my house. It is my marriage. 
It is my identity, and these are my decisions. My, 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 my. Any toddlers in the room like me? Come on. Yes. Honesty. Third, I demand my own version of happiness. My romantic future will showcase my version of happiness, whether or not God approves. It'll showcase my own habits, whether or not God says they're healthy. They will be my entertainment choices and my substances that I choose to have in my life. My version of happiness, whether he agrees with it or not. Do you see how much surrender is in here? I demand my, to believe my own truth. The fact that Jesus would dare come and say that he is the only way to God is deeply offensive to the vast majority of this world. Appreciate that. That is not an easy thing to swallow for most of us. The fact that Jesus would have an opinion or a sexual ethic about what happens in the bedroom, your bedroom, that messes with a lot of us. How dare he? And it goes on and on. I mean, I could talk about the fact that Jesus would dare have an opinion that might be different than your political party's platform. Even if he agrees with some of your political party's platform, he doesn't agree with all of it. And what do you do then? Do you side with your political party's platform or you decide to side with Jesus? It's a real choice, right? Like, who are you living for? When you say Jesus is Lord, is he really? Because that's what heaven will be. Oh God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what you're praying every time you pray the Lord's Prayer? Is God in heaven, your will's always done. I can't wait for heaven where your will's always done. Are you sure? Because this is surrender. So, yes, the grace of God is costly for Jesus on the cross, but it is costly for us. It's not that you have to become a perfect person or goody two-shoes or any of that. It's that you have to surrender actually yourself to him. And when you do that, and he senses that in you spiritually, I don't care what words you used in your sinner's prayer. You will become a new creation, the scripture says. You will become a son or daughter of God. You will be born again, as he said to Nicodemus. All of a sudden, all the, the, uh, the spiritual cogs will, will, will just go into motion, right? And you'll be changed. And all that stuff is invisible. We don't even see it, but it's 100% true. And surrender is a choice, and God respects your choice. C.S. Lewis said, there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done, or your will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find, and to those who knock, it is opened. Heaven is free, but grace costs you surrender. Oh, it's a quiet room. Jesus came as a baby at Christmas to rescue humanity, to rescue you. And what's behind all that cost is his love for you. Like he desperately wanted to rescue us. And he was willing to pay any price in order to capture your soul but he will not leave you to the darkness that you demand for yourself because he also loves you too much to let you do that. <sighs> Let's go back to the questions from the very beginning. Are your brains okay? Everybody all right? <laughs> I made this disclaimer for a service. I'll make it again. If you are just brain dead at this point, feel free to begin the nap now. Um, I'll talk to the rest of the room. Uh, final, final questions. What is righteousness and what does it look like? The answer is in Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. You can't do it. It's 10,000 talents. You'll never make it. Do you hear it there? Rather, through the law, we became conscious of our sin. The law was actually good in your life because it woke you up to how bad your situation was. 
But now apart from the law, uh, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all, all who believe. Don't miss this. This is so huge. Jesus' righteousness is given to you. That's the only way it happens. So you are a righteous person today or you are not a righteous person based on whether or not his righteousness was given to you. If you have been born again, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, what happens in the heavenly courtroom, so to speak, is God takes the righteous resume of Jesus Christ and transfers it to your account. Theologians call that imputed righteousness. He imputes it. He transfers it to your account. And so every single day going forward, God looks at you and he sees you through rose-colored glasses, Jesus-colored glasses, you could say. He only sees the resume of his son, everything that Jesus did right and everything he avoided doing wrong. God sees that resume in you. He doesn't see your sins. Some of you are hearing some of the other questions. Wait, what, if, what about my future sins? Same thing. He only sees the righteousness of Jesus. That's amazing grace. That's crazy stuff, right? It's no more yo-yo stuff between you and God. I am now justified, past tense, if I've reached out to Jesus Christ. I get to live in the reckless love of God for the rest of my life. And I don't fear the judgment at all, ever, because I know how the judgment's going to go. The same grace that carries me every single day will carry me through that judgment. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. Next question. Why do we pray for forgiveness of our sins if our sins from the past, present, and future were forgiven a long time ago? I'm going to move through this really, really quickly. And I'm going to assume the people who ask this question are believers already and know some of the Bible. So I'm going to do this fast. But first is 1 John 8 through nine. First John 1, 8 through 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is written to believers who are already saved. And he says, listen, if you're a believer who's already saved, you're gonna keep sinning. Amen? You're gonna keep sinning. You don't stop. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the point here is if you're a Christian, you still take your sins to God. You still confess them. That's interesting. I thought you said I had the righteous resume of Jesus. You do. So I'll, I'll, I'll let this next verse explain it. John 13, 10. Jesus replied, a person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet. <laughs> Where did we just turn? Okay, here's the scene of this passage. Jesus is washing the disciples' feet right before he dies on the cross. And as he goes around, to the, to the 11, and he's washing their feet, Peter stops him and says, you'll never wash my feet, Lord. Peter's trying to be humble. We love Peter, because when he fails, he fails big, amen? amen. Just like us. <laughs> so he says, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And Je Jesus says, Peter, I gotta wash your feet, and here's why, and this is Jesus explaining. He says, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for their feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. What does it mean, not all of you? He means Judas there. Because Judas is like that servant from the very first parable who did the things and followed Jesus around, but it never took. And Jesus is saying he wasn't clean. He wasn't changed. He wasn't born again. For Jesus knew who would betray him. This is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. So Jesus holds it up and says, okay, you're saved you being saved, it's like you've had a one-time bath, and you're clean. Congratulations. God gave this to you. You are clean. But you're still going to walk around in the muck and mud of this life. And so tomorrow you're going to do some stuff, right? And at that point, you don't need to get rebathed and resaved again. You just need a foot washing. That's cool. Right? Like, you just need to come to God, and I, I, I believe this is what the scripture has in mind here. I just come to God, and I don't yo-yo like, like I'm unsaved. I come to God like a super healthy relationship would be, and I say, God, you said I'm forgiven, but I blew it, and I feel some distance between you and I. God, I feel like there's some weight between you and I. Would you clean that up? Like, I'm not looking for a big deal. I'm not going to do a big penance. I'm not going to walk around feeling super guilty for the next week. I'm just going to say, God, would you clean me up? 
He's going to say, yes, you're forgiven. Amen. Move on. Like breathing in and out. Just move. That's living in grace. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Last question. We've been taught to ask forgiveness and that we'll be forgiven and our sins forgotten by God. However, we've only been taught we'll face judgment. We've also, sorry, been taught that we'll face judgment at the end for all we've done. So are my sins forgiven and forgotten or do they linger until judgment day? Could you elaborate and back it up with scripture? I, again, the boldness of this person. I just love it. Matthew 7, on judgment day, many will say to me, this is Jesus speaking, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast demons out in your name and perform many miracles in your name. What you should see in this person's phrasing is they're trying to hold up their own resume. They're trying to say, I did good stuff, Jesus. Let me into heaven. What does he say? I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. What is the basis for his judgment on judgment day? And by the way, we will all be there at judgment day. Whether you want to or not, it is the one appointment we will all keep. We'll all stand before God. Scripture says the books will be opened, and there'll be a book of life there. And your name is either in the book of life because you surrendered to Jesus, or it's not. It's your choice, and God won't make it for you, and he won't force you. And he judges this person based on whether or not he knew him. You're like, hold on a second. I thought, I thought he was going to list off all my sins to me. I thought he was going to take the pile of everything that I had ever done wrong, and he was going to read it all back to me, and I was going to be mass shamed in front of humanity. Anybody ever think that? Come on. But if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, he only sees the righteousness of Jesus. When he looks at you that day, only one question will matter. It's a one-question test. Did you give yourself to Christ? And, and either A, you'll say no, and it's like, okay, well, then let's deal with your pile. Because you've chosen to deal with your pile yourself, and it's a bad picture. Or Jesus took it for you, and so all I see is righteousness. It's not cheap grace. It's costly grace, amen? Would you stand? I love that the ancient Christians understood something about us. They understood how forgetful we are. And so what did they do? They built it into the, into the calendar that we would celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every single year. We would celebrate the birth of the Savior every single year. So we would never, ever forget. Do you realize that you're walking in the steps? No matter what our culture does with Santa Claus and the rest of it. Come on. No matter what. We're walking in the steps that they set before us. Don't ever forget. Because when we forget, we stop being grateful. And so my prayer is for, for, for you that have already been born again in this room. My prayer is that there was some new clarity for you as far as what costly grace actually means. Because if you could get that, if that could come home to you in a whole new way, the gratitude that should flow out of you, the respect for your Lord that should flow out of you, it should change the way that you live. Amen? Change the way we all live. So I'm going to pray for you. And then after that, I'm going to pray for those of you who've never surrendered. Or maybe you tried to surrender, but you're like, I'm like that first servant. Somehow I went through these motions. I don't know what, what went wrong, but it just didn't happen for me. The heart change didn't happen. I don't find myself worshiping, loving, serving God. And so we're going to hold that out again for you, okay? And we're going to pray that prayer together. All right, let's pray. Jesus, for my born-again brothers and sisters, God, we pray for clarity. We pray that your truth would go deep in us. We pray, Lord, that this reminder of just how much Jesus was willing to pay for us, God, would, would just hit home. Lord, wake us up. 
Help our gratitude to spill over into worship. Help our gratitude to spill over into actual spiritual power in our own lives to change us more and more and more because it's what we want. Let that be done in our lives, Jesus. We love you so much. Thank you for rescuing us. Amen. And now for those of you who want to pray this prayer, we're all going to pray it together, phrase at a time. And I just want to say, there are no magic words here, okay? It's not in the words, it's in your heart. Will you reach out to God truly in these words? And you may go through the motions right now, and you're like, I'm going to take that prayer, and I'm going to pray it my own way tonight or tomorrow. God bless you. Do that. If you reach out to God today for the very first time in your life, we have got free Bibles in the back of the church. All you got to do is walk back there and say, I would like my free Bible, please. They will not ask for your name. They will not stalk you home, I promise. But we would love for you to have the Word of God. It's a study Bible. It will just help you. We'd love for you to have that in your life. So let's pray, Lord God. And let's say these phrases together. Dear Lord Jesus. Thank you for paying my debt. Thank you for paying every cent so that I don't have to pay. Thank you for satisfying justice. Thank you for loving me. I give myself to you. Everything. All of me. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive, my sins. Forgive my sins. Make me a new person. Make me a new person. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Amen.